Vox Novus, the new voice. Vox Novus, the new dimension. Vox Novus, thought and movement leaders who will share from their experience and offer tools to help us navigate our rapidly changing world. My name is Victor Furman. Welcome to Vox Novus, the new voice. If you're not pursuing a rewarding career, not in a loving relationship, not financially secure, healthy or vital, aren't fulfilling your purpose and passion, or don't even know what your purpose or passion is, then you may be stopping yourself without even knowing it. My guest this week on Vox Novus, psychic therapist and medium Vincent Jenna says, your brain has unconsciously created blocks that sabotage your efforts to create a meaningful life. The bottom line, you don't believe what you think you believe. Vincent Jenna, known as a tell-it-like-it-is, truly authentic psychic therapist and spiritual teacher, uses his extraordinary psychic abilities to help clients clear unconscious blocks and fulfill their purpose. His website is vincentjenna.com, and he joins me this week to share his new book, The Secret That's Holding You Back. Please welcome back Vincent Jenna. Welcome, Vincent. Oh, my gosh, Victor, it's so great to be back here again with you. Thank you so much for inviting me back. My pleasure. And your new book is amazing. And we're going to be getting into that. But first, let's talk about your early life. Your initial calling and the path that you envisioned for yourself was quite different from the wonderful work and wisdom that you share with our world today. Please tell us about Vincent Jenna, singer, dancer and actor. Oh, my goodness, Victor. I mean, that seems like such a long, long time ago in ancient uh, days. But yes, um, when I first started out in my youth, I had been tormented throughout my childhood until I was 17 years old. But during it, my resilience was the fact that I was a pretty good little singer, actor and dancer. And so uh, I appreciated performing in front of audiences. And I love that applause. That was at least one way of me accepting that there was something of value with me and accepting some love. So that was my beginning roots. I held on to that and grasped onto the need. It was a need to be a singer, actor, and dancer. And I needed to get an Academy Award and I needed to get a Tony and an Emmy sometime. That was my original goal in life, right? Uh, But it was more so to prove that I was worth something since I had been through so much torment, not only with my school peers and in my school experience, but also at home with mom and dad. So originally, that was my intention. And I was pursuing that. And I started pursuing at a young age. At 19 years old, I had my first nightclub act. Um, I had these managers, Victor, Hal and Sal, Hal and Sal. Um, They were hysterical. Uh, One Jewish gentleman, one Italian gentleman. And uh, I went and I sang at different nightclubs and Sons of Italy and all of those places right when I was young. So I was gung ho. I thought I was great. I was dynamite. I was hot stuff. And then all of a sudden at uh, 28 years old, well, before 28, at 22 years old, I um, actually made it into the movie Grease as a singer and a dancer. And believe it or not, and even though I did not have any major part, but that movie completely changed my life. And the way it changed my life is... I was going to my 10-year high school reunion, which was only a few years after that movie was released. And of course, you know, it was an immediate blockbuster. I mean, people by the droves were going to see that movie. And so that anybody in it was automatically a star. And I came from a small town, Levittown on Long Island, Levittown, uh, and Long Island, right? Long Island, I should say. Long Island, that's right. You're about uh, that. You were that's about 25 minutes from where I live right now. <laughs> wow, fabulous! You see, we were close already. There you go. And so I was a small town star, and there was you know write ups about me and everything. 
And a few years later is when my high school reunion, my first high school reunion, and darn, I was going to go to that high school reunion because I was somebody now. You know, they were picking on me before, and now I'm somebody. And they come to find out, they didn't even expect me to show up. But when I did, I was married. My beautiful wife, you know, of already a few years was in my arm. And uh, we had a two-year-old child. So I felt pretty good, big chip on my shoulder. And I walked into that hall of the reunion, and it really was like a Cinderella story. The entire hall just froze. Everybody looked at me. And the guy who did most of the picking on me and caused most of my antagonism with the jocks came running up to me, gave me a bear hug. And from that moment on, we became dear friends. And he was my major tormentor. And why this is so important is because at the time, his life was falling apart and I was feeling it, but he never said anything about it. But he was one of those ones that you say, so how are you doing? And the rest of the conversation would be about how fabulous his life was. Work and children, married his high school sweetheart, three kids, successful job in Manhattan, beautiful condo in Connecticut. And I just kept hearing Victor BS, BS, BS. But nobody else was. And we became closer and closer and closer. And my heart was breaking for him because I kept feeling his pain deeper and deeper and deeper. And after a visit, a weekend visit, I prayed to God that I could get some ability to help this guy and people like him. I I had no idea how to be able to help him. And so I was begging for that help, you know, singer, actor and dancer. I didn't know anything, you know, on how to counsel people or talk with people, even just general. And within a week's time is when everything happened to me, Victor. And that's when the gates of spiritual, paranormal, metaphysical events started occurring. And I started gaining these unbelievable paranormal abilities, a psychic ability, a telepathic ability. I was reading people's minds. I was knowing what was coming up. I was knowing what was happening from people's pasts. And I was being told that my life was going to change and I was going to become a spiritual teacher. Let's let's How talk about that. Let's talk about that act of forgiveness uh, for a moment, uh, because I think that's so important in this world. That act of forgiveness and grace was life changing for you. Please share with us the importance of forgiveness today, especially for us all. Oh, my gosh, Victor. It, um, but people don't understand is when you don't forgive somebody, it is not hurting them. It is hurting you. It is such a weight, such a burden, such a hurt, such a pain in your heart, because what's really happening is if, and you read my book, it's a defense mechanism. Lack of forgiveness is an actual defense mechanism. Okay, so you say, well, what am I defending myself with? They they hurt me. I didn't hurt them. Ah, yes, you think that consciously. But unconsciously, we grow up blaming ourselves for everything that occurs to us. We start as children because we're egocentric and we think the world revolves around us. So good, bad, or indifferent, we blame ourselves. But as we get older, we do the same thing and we do it unconsciously. So your lack of forgiving somebody else is actually a lack of forgiving yourself. So there's a lot of books on forgiveness, and they talk about how important it is to forgive other people, but they rarely, rarely mention why it's working. And it works because you're letting go of self-blame and self-denigration and self-loathing when you forgive other people, including parents, including enemies. It doesn't make a difference. Here's a proof of that, Victor. As a social worker, I went back to school. I got my psychology degree and I got my master's in clinical social work. And as a social worker, we help all different kinds of people. And one group of people we help is women who come from domestic violent situations. Our biggest hurdle an obstacle that we have to overcome with these women 
Can you imagine what it is, Victor, at all? Go ahead. It's getting them to stop blaming themselves for their partner being abusive of them. The first thing the women say when we tell them you've got to get out of that relationship is, no, it's not his fault. It's my fault. I make him mad. Now, these aren't children anymore. These are adult women. And they are not unconsciously saying that. They are consciously saying that. And there's so much proof that we blame ourselves. So therefore, forgiveness and the reason it works so powerfully is because you're forgiving yourself for why somebody may have mistreated you. Absolutely. Now, getting back to your path. So after that reunion and after that act with that gentleman, what changed your path happened at a psychic reading party that you and your lovely wife, Eileen, were hosting. What (laughs) happened at that gathering? Oh, it was supposed to be. You know how we had Tupperware parties back in the old days? You know, the woman would come over, she'd demonstrate all the Tupperware and everybody would buy it. Right. So one day one of my friends comes over and says, hey, hey, Vince, we got an I got a great idea for you for a party one day. I just went to a psychic party and I was like, what were they demonstrating psychic stuff? What? You know, I didn't know that you could buy psychic stuff. No, 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 no. She goes in a room. You give her a room to go in and you invite some friends over and one at a time everybody goes in and gets a reading done. And then we gather and we talk about it and we laugh about it. It's so much fun. And so I thought, what a hoot. That would be <laughs> that would be something different. And so here, my wife and I, you know, we invited a group of friends who were interested. And yes, we have this psychic come to our house that my this other friend recommended. And it was the craziest, spookiest thing <laughs> because we greet her at the door and already she's freaking out. She's going, <gasps> Oh, my goodness. Oh, my gosh. This house is filled with so much love and energy. You, too, have so much powerful energy. And she says, and also just want to let you know you have a spirit in here helping you. Now, that made us just drop our jaws, Victor, because we were renting this home after we moved back from California to Long Island again, because now I was going to pursue my acting career on Broadway. At least that's what I thought. And we moved into this old house, this Levitt house. And every time my wife and I went to bed and we put our kid down and he was sleeping, there was noise in the kitchen. It was pots and pans banging and cabinets opening and closing. It was the craziest thing. So after a while, my wife and I used to joke and we figured, okay, there's a ghost in there. Do me a favor. Could you wash the dishes while we're sleeping as long as you're in the kitchen? You know, we joked about it because, yeah, yeah, maybe a ghost, something house creaking, whatever. And then she turns around and tells me we have a spirit in the house and it's hanging around the kitchen and it's an Indian female Indian woman. And I'm like, oh, my God. And so that's how it started. We have this party. Everybody goes in. And of course, my wife and I as hosts, we're the last people to go in. So I go in first. My wife wants me to go in first. So I go in first. And. She goes to hold my hand and lets go yelling, oh, my gosh, I can't hold your hands. They're burning me. The soul of Jesus is around you. That's all I feel. And I'm going, Jesus, what do you mean the soul of Jesus? Now, I was a Roman Catholic. I was raised Roman Catholic, but I was not a churchgoer. And I didn't believe in the dogmatic part of the religion. I was an altar boy. And I was back in behind the sacristy, you know, before mass, eating the host and drinking a little of the wine. So I I was wondering, why would Jesus be around me when I was eating his body as candy? You know, I I had no idea why this was happening. And this is this is what she's saying. And then I'm going to become a spiritual teacher in seven years. I went in for that reading so that she could tell me the year that I was going to receive my first Academy Award. That's what I was expecting to hear from her. (laughs) And instead, she turns around and she tells me, I'm going to be a spiritual teacher. And I'm like, what is a spiritual teacher? I'm not becoming a priest. No, no, no. You're going to be a spiritual teacher. You're going to gain all of these gifts and abilities to be able to help people and teach people. And in the beginning, you'll start small and it'll keep expanding and expanding and you will be speaking to people of the world. I thought she was nuts, (laughs) but 
I was curious. And my wife went in and then she confirmed the exact same stuff with her and that our marriage, we were going to have two kids and yada, yada, yada. And our life was going to be completely different. We were going to be traveling and all of this stuff. Right. And of course, she also told me that I would be introduced to people that will help me along the way. Well, that was the beginning of it. And then I was so curious a couple of months later, actually a month later, my wife was at a wedding shower and in the area at the local hotel, they were hosting a psychic fair. It was the first time a psychic fair had ever come to Long Island. I'm like, and especially Levittown, the East Meadow area. I was like, are you kidding me? A psychic fair? So I was like pleading with my wife. We didn't have a lot of money back then. We were a young couple and with the first child. And I was like, let me go. Let me go. Please let me go. I got to find out what she said. And, he, and she's like, yes, go. I, we got to find out what this is all about. So I go. And of course, there's like 20 different psychics and, and practitioners there. And you get to choose one. And I'm like, who do I choose? I'm basically going eeny, meeny, miny, mo. So I pick a guy who does past life readings as well as gives you psychic reading. I said, ooh, OK, that'd be interesting. And so I sit down in front of him. And the first thing he says is, you sing now, don't you? And I go, OK, now I'm going to hear what I want to hear. Yes, baby. <laughs> you got it. Yes, I'm a singer. I'm a professional singer. And he says, well, that's because you were an African female singer for your tribe in a past life. You were the one who sang at the ceremonies and your singing would also call in the tribal members. And I'm like, Oh, actually I really love African music. I said, well, I just chalked it off that. Well, that explains it. Okay. It sounds good. All right. So what's coming up for me? All right. When's my Academy award. And he turns around and he says, you have to stop focusing on being a performer. And my jaw dropped again. And I'm like, what? He said, you're meant to be a spiritual teacher. The soul of Jesus is around you. Now, this is the second guy. And I'm like, wait a minute. You don't know this other one who came to my house, do you? But they didn't know my name or anything. There's no way that they knew each other. I go home and I tell my wife. He tells me the exact same stuff that the first psychic at the house did. And I go looking. This time I'm going to go to the city. Now I go looking for a psychic. These professional ones are in the city, New York City. I'm going to find a real reputable one, not these clowns at a psychic fair and somebody who comes to your house. They don't know what they're talking about. And I go find this, this very well-known one, at least locally, I guess. And I go to Manhattan, Manhattan from Long Island, to go to a psychic the next month. And this psychic turns around and says, the soul of Jesus is around you. You're going to be a spiritual teacher and he's going to help you with the words. And how could I refuse that now? That's how it began with a psychic. And then my curiosity kept leading me to people and friends who were automatic writers who now introduced me to my own guide besides Jesus was telling me how I can communicate with my guide. And shortly after that, I had an unbelievable download and became a trance without even knowing what a trance was. And I'm speaking as this other guide with all of these words of the most incredible wisdom coming out. Victor, I really thought I was going crazy, but it was too positive. It was too loving. And that's the reason why my wife, thank God, she was with me since I was 17 years old. So she knew the things I was talking about. I had no idea about beforehand. All these these ancient things we used to go at that point. We went to the library and we would go to the bookstore. And back then, the spiritual section was called the occult section. You remember that? Victor? Oh, absolutely. And we're sneaking around because I didn't want anybody seeing me in the occult section that knew me in my town. Right. And so we're picking up books, you know, that the, the teachings of the masters of the Far East the Bhagavad Vida, we all the anything, anything that we could we could pick up the words of Lao Tzu, ancient wisdom. And we would thumb through just thumb through real quick and we would stop on pages of paragraphs that I had spoken when I was trancing mm. paragraphs that were in those books. And we would look at each other and go, 
all right, something crazy is going on here. Oh my gosh, this is, this is crazy. How did I know these words? I never read these books before. The exact words. And that's what was happening. And then I was finally directed to the Ed Casey Foundation and material. I was told I needed to study there. And that began normalizing me. But here's a funny thing. I have to thank Oprah Winfrey. And one day, I'm either going to be on Super Soul Sunday or be interviewed by her because I need to talk with her. I was sitting in front of the TV babysitting my son one one day after this began. And I'm watching. I just happened to turn on the TV and I turned on Oprah Winfrey. And one of my favorite actresses was on Shirley MacLaine. And it was when Shirley MacLaine came out of the spiritual closet, Victor. Mm -hmm. And she started talking about a new book out on a limb and her spiritual experiences. And we had such similar experiences. She actually normalized my experience for me. I got on the phone and I'm calling, talking to my wife. I'm saying, you're not going to believe this. Shirley MacLaine just had the same experience and she's on Oprah Winfrey talking about it. And it was unbelievable, the similarities, and it made me feel so comfortable and real and that I knew all right, something was going on somehow, some way. And that's when I began to pursue it, but very slowly. And I started researching everything I could, but very, very cautiously and slowly because I couldn't give up wanting to be an actor. And I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing with these new gifts. Now I do. Now you do. My guest is Vincent Jenna, his brand new book, The Secret That's Holding You Back. Vincent, please tell our listeners where they can get your book and find out more about you and your amazing work. Oh, all they have to do is go to my website at vincentjenna.com. That's with a G-E-N-N-A to connect with me. And that'll direct you to all my different social media pages. But you can go to Amazon today. It's had been released June 21st. The secret that's holding you back. It's it's so powerful, Victor. And that's the basic place that they can get it. And and also all fine bookstores and booksellers online uh, are selling it. So, um, yeah, that's it. Go to my website and connect with me there on my Facebook page or Instagram, any of them. And we'll be back with more of Vincent after these words on the Olden Times Radio Network. The best of the holistic, spiritual, and conscious world. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Om Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Look out, world, we're getting strong. The future's here and we belong. She can step, she can do more. Like build a rocket and watch it soar. Or clean the oceans and make the world a better place. Oh, she can step, so can you. Find a cure, invent something new. There's no challenge in the world that she can't face. She can step. Learn more at She Can STEM, a message brought to you by the Ad Council. Back on Vox Novus, my guest this week is Vincent Jenna. We're talking about his new book, The Secret That's Holding You Back. Vincent, one of the things that you shared with me the last time we spoke was your experience of channeling Joseph of Canaan. What was that message about? Oh, wow. Yes. Well, it turns out that Joseph was my major guide besides Jesus, but Joseph did all the talking when I would then channel. And it it wasn't at first natural. Like I said in the beginning, it became, it happened very unnaturally. All of this wisdom was piling into my head and I had to speak it. I had to, I was forced. I was so um, compelled to speak the words that were coming into me. And that's how it began. And of course, it was just between my wife and I. Now, I was doing that before Abraham Hicks came about, you know, but 
I wasn't going to bring it public. We're talking about back in the 1980s, the early 1980s that this began, actually mid 80s, that this began with me. And so the new age movement had started, but it really wasn't out in the open, right? The new age movement was more for those hippies you know, who were into it or those woo-woo people from California, right? Where I had been living prior doing my movie career. And so when this began happening to me, um, Joseph introduced himself. And it's so funny because the way he wound up really introducing my, himself to me and before coming through me was from a friend of mine. When this was beginning to go on, I wasn't talking to, about this to a lot of people at all. Maybe my family, you know, we did. Uh, who thought I was nuts for sure? My wife was the only one who didn't think I was nuts. And then a friend of mine who was visiting from California, an actress friend, and she was really close. So I knew I could talk to her. So I started talking to her about what was happening. And then she opens up and says, you know, my husband is an automatic writer. And I'm like, what's an automatic writer? Well, he communicates with his guides and they write through him. I said, they write through him. Are you kidding me? Now you're a crazy one too. Why didn't you tell me about this while I knew you? And she said, because we don't talk about these things. You know how people <laughs> don't accept them. So it was very hidden. And I'm like, oh my gosh. She says, well, we were taking a trip back to California for a friend's wedding. And she said, why don't you go see him and see what happens? So I go and see him. He does all this writing for me and turns around and he starts with his guide and then introduces me to the one I'm supposed to be talking to besides Jesus, this Joe. Joe, he says, Joe. So I get to speak to Joe. I said, oh, that's convenient. My brother's name is Joe, so at least I'm not going to forget him. So gives me all of these messages. Yes, you can talk with Joe. Well, I get back with all of this information on paper and I, I'm like, I'm reading it over and over and over again because it was just crazy. So my wife says, why don't you call up your first, our first psychic who came to the house and I can use her name. Her name was Doris and uh, go see her. Doris lived in Queens and we lived there. We were, were still renting in Levittown. Go see Doris. Okay. I'm going to go see Doris. She's the one who started this whole thing. So I might as well. So I call her up. I don't tell her anything. I just say, I, do, I need to talk with you. Can I come at any time? She said, oh, my gosh, why don't you come on Wednesday? I'm having my meditation group. I didn't know what meditation was at that time, except a bunch of people sitting around and oming. That's the, you know, you see that on TV. We're going to sing Kumbaya and we're going to meditate. Who, with crazy other crazy people? I can't believe. <laughs> so she has me come out. All right. So it's going to be about 12 people there. 12 people. Oh, my gosh. So I come into her home and there's all different people there, men and women, younger, older. And she introduces me and she says, I need you to remember this person's name, Vincent Jenna, because within seven years, he is going to be a known spiritual teacher. And beyond that, he's going to become internationally renowned. And I'm embarrassed. I turned so red. I can feel my face flaming if embarrassment because I'm like, are you kidding me? I don't even know what to say to these people. And now you're telling them I'm going to be a famous spiritual teacher. It was really driving me crazy that she actually said that. And but but these people were school teachers, nurses, doctors. A lawyer was even there. And I'm like, wow, these are normal people. You mean normal people meditate and they're not smoking pot? I was just like, okay. So we sit down in a circle in her living room. There's a candle in the middle of the room and there's like all these chairs in a circle. And I'm like, oh boy, okay. And it's dark. She turns out all the lights other than the candle that's lit in the middle and she starts guiding us, close your eyes, your outer eyes, and we're just going to sit here for a while and meditate. And all of a sudden, I start hearing people going, oh, my gosh, do you see that? And I'm like, oh, my God, my eyes are closed. There's no way I'm opening up my eyes now. No, nope, I'm not opening up my eyes. I'm not going to see anything. I don't want to see anything. What are they talking about? And then the next person next to her is going, I do. I see it. It's swirling all around him. And I'm like, 
swirling all around what swirling all around who it and what i was freaking out i was pouring sweat was dripping down my underarms were so drenched it was unbelievable because i i didn't know what they were talking about and then i was feeling all of this heat around me and now all the people and i'm still i still have my eyes closed i refuse to open up my eyes now everybody is talking about oh my gosh the light is all around him and so of course what am i going to do now everybody's talking so i have to open up my eyes i open up my eyes and this white light like smoke is swirling around me in a spiral all around me, just me, but it's lighting up the entire room. It was pitch black in the room, and now the room is really bright, and this light is swirling around me and swirling all the way up straight through the ceiling of the living room, and I'm frozen. I'm frozen in panic, in, in, in totally panic, and they're just staring at me. I, was, I don't know if it was embarrassment besides fear, and all of a sudden, the psychic Doris starts talking, but she's not talking as Doris. She's talking as a man and a man's voice and turns around and says, this is how she starts it. All right, Victor, and I'm not exaggerating any of this for any of your listeners. All right. This is exactly how it happened. And she turns around and she says, don't call me Joe. My name is Joseph. Mm. From Canaan. Now, mind you, I never had the chance to tell her yet about my visit with my friend and the pages that were in my back pocket about this Joe guy. I never told her. And she starts speaking and I'm freaking out. And she's telling me, I am going to be your guide. You'll be able to talk with me. I am going to help you mostly, though Jesus will be around to help us as well but I'm the one you will be communicating with. And that's how it started. Now, Joseph from Canaan is really interesting because just prior to that entire situation, I was in a show and it was a Memorial Day weekend and the cast, one of the cast members had a family home upstate New York and invited the entire cast to spend the Memorial Day weekend at his parents' farm. It was a farm. And it was right outside of Albany. And so we all go upstate there. Now, this is with the cast. And while we're there in town at the local regional theater was the musical Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. <sighs> well, I was, a, you know, I was into musical theater, right? I knew all the shows. This, this had just opened up on Broadway, and now it was going out on tour. And it was a touring company, and I hadn't seen it yet. So we go and see it. Now, this is, remember, this is all prior to all this download and all of this spiritual stuff happening to me. And we're watching it, and I cried through the entire show. I, I could do nothing but cry for Joseph because I felt his pain with what his brothers did to him and torment him. I kind of related to it with all the torment I had been through. Right. And then I was so I, I was it was so amazed how he became so well known and famous and how loving he still was. I just I didn't understand. My wife was looking at me saying, Vin, Vinny, why are you so choked? up?" I said, I don't know. I feel this guy. I feel this guy. And I don't know why I'm feeling this guy. And then this whole thing happened. So when I see this, my friend in California, and he's telling me about Joe, I never made the link. Mm. But, you know, Joe, you know, yo, Joe, I'm an Italian guy. Of course, I'm going to get a Joseph. My brother's Joseph. I've got three cousins named Joseph. Italians do that. you right. So another Joe. All right. Sounds good. Then it turned out to be Joseph from Canaan. And it was just from that point on, I realized I did realize, OK, this is deep. I've got to take this seriously. And when we got home, after I went to Doris, after she started speaking to me as Joseph, I needed to know more of the story. I wanted to read the story. And I go find my wife's. My wife was Jewish and she had a bat mitzvah. Mm -hmm. 
when she was 13 and she had a little Bible that they gave her, the Old Testament. And, you know, she never even opened it. It was beautiful, white with gold leaf. You know, it was beautiful and it was packed away and it was in our garage, packed away in a box. I find it and I take it out and I'm thumbing through and I'm like, I don't even know what chapter Joseph would be in, right? So I'm thumbing through the pages, just flipping them back. And one page opens up. It's brand new Bible. And there is one page with the corner. You know how you get some books if the if the corner is folded back and then the book is cut, mm. the corner is still back there, but it's a cut corner. It's like, you know, it, it extends out if you unfold it yep. because it was folded. There's one page in the Bible with the corner doing that. And so it's, it was kind of like a little tab. And I go to it and it begins the story of Joseph. The son, son of Jacob. Jacob. The, the son, son of Jacob. Jacob. And we've had a close relationship ever since, <laughs> me so, and that Joseph. Is, that is so, so wonderful. Your new book is entitled The Secret That's Holding You Back. What inspired this book? That's a great question. I appreciate you ask, asking me that. I've been doing this work for 40 years now, almost 40 years. I've been involved in the metaphysical field, the spiritual field, the psychology field. So I've been doing a lot of studying and research. Then I have had thousands of readings with people from all over the world, Victor. And as I'm learning and growing, and I'm learning about the law of attraction, and I'm learning that we're capable of manifesting, I'm looking at those who are manifesting and, and those who are not, which is the majority of people are not manifesting what we're supposed to be able to manifest. And I'm digging deep down inside and even doing research projects to find out what's different about this group than this group. And what was different is that one group that was truly manifesting was truly believing in their ability to manifest and what they wanted to manifest. The other group said they believed, but when I went inside and when I was doing my psychotherapy work even... I come to find out that people don't believe what they think they believe. And so I realized that the core of all of these books, because at first my book was going to be called God, It's Not Working, What One Man Found That Makes Everything Work. That was going to be the original title of my book, because everybody now is all, they're all involved in this new age, new thought movement. They listen to all these fabulous shows, just like your, your own. They're reading all these fabulous books. They're going to these seminars and now online for everything. But they keep trying and saying that it's not working. It's not working. It's not working. Yet I know it works. I know the material and the wisdom works. That's why it's ancient wisdom, because it works. And it's lasted so long. But what's not working are people's beliefs. And so I wrote this book to teach people why and what is happening. There are anomalies of the brain that the brain has created purposely in order to help people get through life as humans. And the thing is, the two highest functions of the brain is one, to keep us alive, and two, to protect us in order to keep us alive. Well, we certainly know how it protects us physically. I even just recently experienced that. When you get the coronavirus, you get a fever. That's one of the symptoms. But it's actually not the virus that's causing the fever. It's your brain that causes the fever. Why? Because it wants to raise the body temperature to an environment that the virus cannot live in. So it heats up your body purposely. That's what a fever is for. It doesn't pay attention to the fact that the fever is uncomfortable, and if it goes too high, it could even kill you. That is not its primary goal. As soon as that virus gets in there, it has to protect us, and its primary goal is to get rid of the virus. All right, it does that physically. So what happens when you have emotional pain? 
and you've gone through your youth being tormented and abused, and you come up with feelings of, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, I'm not lovable, I'm not deserving. Well, those are painful, and you certainly can't function in life walking around with those pains. We see some people who don't have strong enough defense mechanisms, and that's where depression comes from, or panic disorder, or any of those mental pathologies, Victor. And so the ones, the majority of people have what's called coping skills. And the coping skills actually is the brain having created a new set of beliefs to shield you and protect you from your original set of beliefs. So instead of believing that, well, I'm not good enough and that's the reason why I didn't get the raise this year, you can turn around and say, well, you know, it's work. There are hard things going on at work, or my boss is an idiot, or they, they, they didn't make enough money. That's the reason why I didn't get my raise. You can come up with all these defense mechanisms. And that's what I write in my book as my adult made mind that creates these defense mechanisms. And we're going to touch upon those aspects of the mind in our next segment. My Uh, guest is Vincent Jenna. His new book is entitled The Secret That's Holding You Back. We'll be back with more of Vincent after these words on the OM Times Radio Network. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site, but a spiritual dating site with a purpose to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free. AscendingHearts.com So I'm a cat, and I just moved in with this new human, and she's got this little toy she's always playing with, all day long. Tap, 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 bloop, bloop. She can't put it down. There it is. Oh, and get this. She even talks to it. Last week, she asked it for Chinese. And guess what? Egg rolls showed up like magic. Humans have cool toys. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the ShelterPetProject.org. Humanity Healing International is a small nonprofit with a big dream. Since 2007, HHI has been working tirelessly to bring help to communities with little or no hope. Our projects are not broad mandates, nor are they overnight solutions, but they bring the reassurance that no one is alone and that someone cares. To learn more, please visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Right now our country feels divided, but there's a place where people with different political views and life experiences are coming together through the power of conversation, and it feels good. Hear more at lovehasnolabels.com slash one small step. A message from StoryCorps, Love Has No Labels, and the Ad Council. Back on Box Novus, my guest this week, Vincent Jenna, his new book is called The Secret That's Holding You Back. So, Vincent, you've come up with a new model of the mind. Originally, the original psychological model was three-part. You added a fourth part and a fifth part. Tell us about that, please. I did. And, and you know, it's really interesting because we don't know how many parts there really are. When, when Freud was doing all this work on the mind, because he helped to really, you know, designate the sections, you know, he was looking at um, what he could see, what he could find, what he could reason with. And so that's how they came up with the conscious, the subconscious, the superconscious or the unconscious mind. It was actually Carl Jung who um, then called it the superconscious, who was Freud's student and became very famous. So that was that. And so we know that the brain likes to compartmentalize. And that was another thing I learned in psychology. We have all these compartments because the humans love compartments. Like they have their compartments for their family and then their compartments for their friends and their compartments with work. And they may act different and they apply energy to each one of those compartments. And we kind of discovered in, in research that the more compartments a person has, the healthier they seem to be. So the brain likes to compartmentalize. So now here we come into this world, and I believe that the soul's mind is actually contained in your superconscious mind. And Carl Jung was really close when he was talking about 
that that's where the mind is connected to the collective unconscious mind, where all wisdom is, all the knowledge, all the knowing is in that mind, or another way of putting it, the mind of God. Well, if that's where that connection is, then the soul has to be at that point. Now, the soul is all positive and loving and comes from the other side and is totally connected to the God source. And it's growing and it's remembering and knowing who it is, right? Coming from the other side and all this love and support that's on the other side. Now, it comes into a world where the messages aren't necessarily so positive and there's all these negative messages and children start to absorb these messages because they're sponges. But the mind is not going to, the brain is not going to mix those negative messages in the unconscious part of the mind where the soul's mind is, because that's like mixing oil and vinegar. No, they don't belong there. I got to make another compartment for these negative things. So I call that other compartment the environment made mind or the EMM. Why the environment made mind? Because like I said, we're sponges when we first come in and all the messages we receive from the environment, oh, you shouldn't have done that. That's a bad boy. That's a bad girl. Or you could do better than that. Or um, all of those kinds of negative messages, any of the abuse, any of the, the socioeconomic background messages we receive about being poor, about being rich, whatever it is, those messages get harbored and collected together in that environment made mind. The other words I use to define those messages are the I'm nots. That's what we harbor, the I'm not good enough, I'm not lovable, I'm not deserving. I, I talked about that earlier. So that's that compartment. Now that compartment is going to go right on top of your unconscious mind or the superconscious mind where your soul is, because that's the closest level now to the conscious mind. And it's blocking the soul's mind. So when your soul is trying to tell you, no, you're really good, you're loving, you're divine, don't forget that. And then you keep getting all these negatives. Yeah, but I'm not good enough. That's what I was just told. I'm not lovable because they're giving me negative attention. They don't like me. That's why they're picking on me. That's the messages I received anyway while I was growing up. That's blocking all of the positive messages coming from your unconscious or superconscious mind or soul's mind. Well, now that's while you're young. As we grow up and the mind starts to develop and the brain starts to develop, what did I say the two highest functions of the brain are? One, to keep us alive. Two, to protect us. So to protect you, now it's feeling all of these bad negative feelings in the environment made mind. And so now it's got to protect you. And the way it's going to protect you is changing those beliefs. But the only way it can change it is by creating a new set that blocks off the old set of beliefs. And I call that section of that compartment of the mind and the brain the adult made mind. I keep it simple, really. The label, I don't have to name it, you know, the Jenna, because I, it was my last name and I discovered it. <laughs> you know, the Jenna mind. Um, uh, no, it's make it simple for people to understand. That's why I labeled it the way I labeled it. So, so now you've got this section, you've got your conscious mind, you've got your subconscious mind, and that's the automatic part that can't change. But now, right beneath the subconscious mind is that adult made mind. And in there, your brain starts to create and your mind starts to create the defense mechanisms. And Freud named 10 of them. And I can't go through all 10. But, you know, suppression, repression, denial, sublimination, uh, projection, all of those rationalization, all of those get harbored in the adult made mind now, which is pushing down all the messages that are coming up from the environment made mind. I'm not good enough. I'm not lovable. No, by the time that reaches the adult made mind, the adult made mind shuts that off and says, no, it's not that you're not lovable. They're not lovable. They're the bad people. They are the haters. They're the bigoted ones. They're the racists. You're not. You're good. You're you're you don't you think about that. Don't you think about that. 
But meanwhile, why does any of that matter? Why can't we just live from that adult made mind section of beliefs? Number one, because they're fake. They're not real. It's not what we're really believing. Those were only created for us to cope. Those coping mechanisms. There you go. That word again to get you through life. But it's funny when there's crises, that's when you see people's defense mechanisms break down. Why do they break down? Because they're not real, because they're in that adult made mind. What is real is what's left below. Now, here's the second reason why it's so important to understand this. We are forces. We are powers. We're connected to a force. George Lucas called it the force in Star Wars. Well, actually, George Lucas is very metaphysical and spiritual. And that entire movie, I believe, is about us and our relationship with the God force, that force, that power that we're all connected with. And we're here to try to grow and learn to be all Luke Skywalkers and Jedi Knights. But we also have the capacity to be Darth Vader's. That was also the story of Cain and Abel from the Old Testament. We have the capacity to be both Abel and Cain. And we see that actually happening today. We see the Cains in the world. And why? Because of the hurts. So here we are in the adult made mind with all of these new beliefs. But we are connected to this power. But where are we connected to the power? A lot of the teachings of the law of attraction are a little misleading. They're correct but they're misleading. Why? Because the primary thing that is taught is that your thoughts create. Your thoughts create. Well, your thoughts are what you can control because that's your left brain thinking. You can control your thoughts, but your thoughts don't actually create. Your beliefs create. And your thoughts influence your beliefs. Now, people need to be taught that, Victor, to truly understand, because they're walking around thinking, if I'm thinking the right thing, if I'm thinking I deserve a wonderful love in my life, that you're going to attract the right partner, if I'm thinking I'm going to get a great job, if I'm thinking I'm going to become a millionaire, if I'm thinking all of that, I'm going to create that. No, you're not. You're not going to create that because if thoughts created, half the world right now would be dead and the other half would be billionaires from winning the lottery because that the instant you would have a thought, it would be plugged into the power. Boom. It would create something that doesn't happen. It's the unconscious core beliefs. So the law of attraction and the power and the force is connected to your unconscious portion of the mind, which is right next to the EMM or the environment made mind. So when you're thinking, I deserve this job that I'm applying for now, and you don't get it, and you don't get the next job, and you don't get the next job, it's not because you think you deserve it, or it's not because it's just the way life is going and you're unlucky. It's because deep down in your environment made mind, you've got that voice that's saying you're not good enough. You're not going to get that job. Now, that's what's empowering the law of attraction. That's the energy that's being released from you. So, no, you're not going to get the job. No, you're not going to find true love if you don't believe you're lovable. No, you're not going to have your finances balanced out and finally experiencing abundance in all areas of your life because you don't believe you're deserving enough or worthy enough or good enough for all of that. That's why I wrote this book. And that's why people need to know that there's other compartments getting in the way of us thriving. Oh, yes. People call me from all over the world, Victor. And they're surviving. But that's not why they call me. They call me because they know deep down somewhere something is reminding them. Because remember I said that soul is still trying to get the truth up about who you really are. And every so often you get glimpses of it. And it's trying to tell them that they're supposed to be more than just surviving. 
that you're supposed to be thriving, that you're supposed to be fulfilling your dreams, that you may not even know what your dream is, but you're supposed to have one, that you're supposed to be feeling special because you're a divine being. Those messages are coming to people, but they have no idea what's stopping them. So they don't need me to survive. They've done a good job of surviving. And if you look at the world, we're over 11,000 years old and they're coming to find out we're even older than that. We've lived and thrived. We're not thrived. We've grown and lived and survived for 11,000 years. And every so often, there'll be those who will thrive and will achieve their dreams and will fulfill their light and will feel their highest energy. But the majority aren't. And in your new bad. book, The Secret That's, that's right. Holding You Back, you share a series of steps necessary for people to fulfill their aspirations and yes. dreams. Vincent Jenna, one more time, please tell our listeners where they can get your book and find out more about you. The easiest place to get the book is at Amazon.com or any of the fine retailers. Um, you can go to my website at vincentjenna.com to link with me. And that's with a G-E-N-N-A. And once you do get the book, do the reading. Please read it and do the work. It's going to be the most difficult work you have ever done and the most profound work you have ever done because you are going to see a transformation that you've never seen before. And I have a group that I created on Facebook called The Secret That's Holding You Back. Come and join us there. Share your successes. Share your stumbling blocks. I will be there to speak with you, to help you through it all. We'll share with each other because that's how growth comes is by sharing in unity. And so please pick up the book, do the work, come join the group, Amazon.com and VincentJenna.com. Vincent, thank you. thank you so much for joining us and sharing your wisdom and your grace with our listeners. Well, thank you for having me. It certainly was a pleasure. And we just definitely got to get together again. And it's thank you for allowing me to be able to put this message out into the world. Thank you so much, Vincent. I greatly appreciate this. And thank you for joining us on Vox Novus. I'm Victor, the voice Furman. Have a wonderful week. Mm -hmm.